In seminary, there were two year-long tracks that those of us seeking master's degrees in divinity were required to pursue. One of the tracks was theology and the other biblical studies. And you could take the year-long sequences in any order that you prefer. So many of the first year students flocked to the theology sequence right out of the gates. Suppose that's because many of us hadn't read theology extensively and the topic sounded interesting. But thankfully I talked with my own local pastor before I went to seminary and, and he recommended that I begin with the Bible sequence. You already have a solid background in the Bible, he said, and you've been out of college for 10 years, so it'll be easier to start there. And so I did. I love the opportunity to immerse myself in biblical studies that first year. Of course, some of the parts I enjoyed more than others. And there was one lecture that I spent a good deal of time looking forward to. It was a lecture that I knew would come at the end of the school year. It would be the lecture on the book of Revelation. Now, after nine months of rigorous study, that fateful day finally came. My classmates and I had done all of the assigned reading in the book of Revelation, and we were sitting in the edge of our seats. I'll never forget what happened next. The professor walked in that day, looked at the class and said, I know that today's assigned topic is the book of Revelation. And I know you've all done the reading, so let me say this. No one really understands what the book is all about. And if anyone tells you they do, run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. And with that, he closed by saying, now let's go on to start reviewing for the final tomorrow. That's it. I remember thinking at the time, a whole year of waiting to hear about Revelation. And it was flushed down the toilet in just seconds. Of course, as I graduated from seminary and moved into parish ministry, I came to understand what the professor meant. For while many think of the book of Revelation as little more than a series of terrifying visions designed to get us in line or else, that is not what's going on. The book is less about fear and more about love. I suppose that's why the reading from Revelation you'll hear today pops up every All Saints Day. Now, why do I say that? Well, I'm going to pause this morning and, and read the passage to you. Then we'll come back together and unpack what I said. So here now, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6a, as read from the Common English Bible. Then... I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them, and they will be God's people. God himself will be with them as their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no crying, no mourning, or, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. And he also said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, all is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And thus ends the sacred reading. So after having heard that passage today, you might still be wondering of how I got to the point where I could describe the book of Revelation as a book of love and not fear. Well, Ginger Grab does a beautiful job explaining that very thing in her commentary in this morning's passage. 
Now, while biblical scholars don't agree exactly on who wrote the book, tradition names the author as John of Patmos. Now, John, like many early followers of Jesus, had gotten into trouble for speaking his truth in ways that challenged the powers that be in Rome. Hence, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And while there, Ginger Grab points out, he wrote, and I quote, a letter of comfort to seven churches undergoing persecution, urging their members to remain steadfast and assuring them of one thing, that the Roman Empire's power, and the power of all empires today, I would add, is not absolute. That no matter how bad things get in our lives, we must never let those empires cause us to forget that it is God who reigns supreme. And then Ginger finished with these two observations that make the book's purpose clearly less about fear and more about love. Observation one, she wrote, is that the visions John communicated lift him and us out of everyday life to a heavenly realm where we can finally view earthly existence, not from our perspective, but God's. And observation two has to do with what Ginger called John's enlargement of vision, an enlargement that can completely transform our understanding of what is happening around us. For you see, while some may look around at the world and use a lens of cynicism. We followers of Jesus can look out on that world with some degree of innocence. And while many are overwhelmed with, with despair, we followers of Jesus can be overcome with hope instead. And that, my friends, leads me to the, the saints of our lives that we celebrate this All Saints Sunday. For while we may not all agree on what constitutes a saint, whether we be Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, this morning I can at least share with you my own definition of what a saint is. For me, a saint is a person who does what, what John of Patmos did. That is, to help us see beyond the what is to the what will be. Now, I offer that definition because I think many of us do the saints in our lives a disservice by somehow equating sainthood with perfection. And in doing so, we miss out on so many of those saints in our lives with whom God has blessed us. Even the saint that we can glimpse occasionally in the bathroom mirror. So let me tell you about two of the people in my life who brought me to the definition of saint. Those people are Frida and Bob Peterson, my parents. And here's how they helped form that definition for me. When I entered the world on June 17th of 1967, the world was in a tough space. Two and a half months earlier, the first Arab-Israeli war had been fought. Our own country was in turmoil as we sat in the midst of something called the long, hot summer of 67, a summer when 159 racial protests broke out in the streets of our country. And then, when I was just 10 months old, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and two months later, Robert Kennedy. And if that wasn't enough, Violence even broke out at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Violence unlike any that people had seen before at such gatherings, and at the time I was just 13 months old. And an unpopular war in Vietnam was continuing to ramp up with the reinstitution of the military draft when I was all of 17 months old. 
as I look back at that time, I realized that if there was ever a time when it seemed the world was going to hell in a handbasket, it was in those days. And certainly my parents would have had every reason to raise me as a person who was fearful, pessimistic, and even jaded. But they didn't. In fact, they raised me in exactly the opposite way. As I grew and talked with them about the world and peered into places like the Middle East, I didn't see the violence first. Instead, they helped me see the religious and ethnic differences as opportunities that could expand or broaden our view of the world. And as I grew and later heard reports of racial protests in the streets, my parents helped me not to, to see them as expressions of anarchy, but rather as opportunities to ask ourselves difficult questions about why people were so upset that they felt they needed to take to the streets. And even later conversations about war, such as the one in Vietnam from my childhood, were used to sow the seeds of motivation as I worked for peace. But the most important lesson my parents taught me, those saints, was that was the same lesson that John of Patmos left with us that no matter how bad things might seem at any given moment, that God's and God's love and grace would ultimately get the last word. And friends, that sent me out into the world with a ferocious, and a consuming sense of optimism and hope. And that, then, is what saints do. They help us raise our eyes each day above the what is, so that we can see the what will be. And then they inspire us to join them as we roll up our sleeves together and get to work in, as we become co-creators of the what will be. So while All Saints Sunday is often commemorated by doing things like lighting candles for the deceased or, or sharing pictures and mementos, this year, let's do more to honor the memory of those saints. Let us honor them best by testifying and enacting the love and the hope that they planted in our hearts. And if you do that, you too just might be transformed into a saint as well. May it be so. Amen.